Hi everyone, thanks very much for coming and um, thanks for inviting me to present on the submission process from the publisher's point of view. Uh, my name is Jonathan Patience and I'm a senior editor at Taylor and Francis. Uh, for anyone that doesn't know Taylor and Francis, we're quite a large publisher. We publish um, over 2,500 journals and 5,000 books. And of those, we publish over 200 medical journals. Um, I'll be speaking to you today about um, the, uh, basically the pathway to publication, um, how to submit your manuscript and um, get it through peer review to avoid delays and also to um, basically increase your chances of acceptance. Um, I'll start by just quickly going over the sort of main sort of four stages um, of getting through publication. Um, so when you first submit your manuscript, you'll go through the initial decision by the in-house um, editorial team um, or the editorial board. Uh, usually the editorial office consists of the um, editorial board, the editor's chief, um, in-house publisher, uh, in-house commissioning and managing editors. And they will make that first decision. Uh, then we'll cover um, peer review and the top sort of 10 comments that you receive um, at peer review and what we see the most and how to avoid those. Uh, then I'll talk to you about how to get a quick decision following um, your revision, submitting your revision of your manuscript. Um, and then finally, um, what the authors can do to increase the impact of their paper um, and the, uh, how to measure that impact. Um, but first of all, I just want to talk about a little bit about um, what to think about before you um, submit your manuscript. Um, and I just wanted to touch on pre-submission inquiries. Um, I just really wanted to kind of emphasize the fact that um, I know a lot of people worry about contacting the editorial office with pre-submission inquiries because um, they worry that editors might be too busy or unwilling to ask, answer any queries. But actually, um, we really like receiving them because it saves everyone time. Um, it saves um, us time and it saves the author's time. And it also avoids having to go through that kind of submission process over and over again. Um, it helps to avoid outright rejections and um, if there's ever a time when the um, article isn't quite on scope for the journal you've chosen, um, usually the editors are more than happy to kind of suggest other journals that you might be able to submit to um, and even put you in contact with the editors as well to discuss that. Um, I'm also aware that the um, manuscript exchange common approach um, is working on a way to save time by transferring manuscripts between journals um, very easily. Um, and um, hopefully when that comes around, um, we'll all be able to take advantage of that. Uh, we can also make sure you have all the information that you need prior to submission and that you have the right disclosure forms that you need. I also just quickly wanted to mention the submitting agent function. Um, I know that some people uh, don't, um, may not know about this or um, may, may have used this before, but um, in our journals, uh, Taylor and Francis, um, on the Scholar One, site, we do have the option to mark yourself as a submitting agent. And what that means is that you'll be pulled into all correspondence with the authors so that, um, so that you will actually not miss out on any of that important co correspondence or decision um, letters that you receive. Um, and it's also just a way of, um, an easy way of just being able to submit yourself without the author having to worry about all that. Okay, so um, what do our editors like to see? So. Um, when you submit your paper, um, I would always suggest making sure that you're very aware of what the journal scope is. Um, that's usually the first thing that the ed editorial office will look at. And if it's not on scope, then um, unfortunately it would receive quite a quick rejection. Um, we are usually happy to suggest other journals if we ever do reject something that's off scope. Um, but I would also, if you're ever unsure, I'd also really recommend um, just contacting the editorial office, like I said before, and just asking them about that. Try to also make sure that um, the house style sections are present. Um, you can check the author guidelines just to make sure that um, all the sort of important content that's required for that specific journal is there. Um, we basically need um, all the kind of key content of the article to be there before peer review so that it all can, can all be assessed by the peer reviewers. Um, things like um, reference formatting or heading formatting, um, it doesn't really matter so much at this stage. Um, you can include it if you want, but um, you don't have to if you're worried about kind of having to move between journals. Um, make sure the objectives are really clearly stated. Um, what is it about your paper that actually um, adds to the literature? Why is it important? Why should people read it? Um, and also make sure that you're returning to that quite regularly throughout the manuscript, just to keep it very coherent and keep the message the same. Uh, and try to return to it at the conclusion and make sure that the conclusion you're um, providing is actually provides a novel kind of insight that hasn't been spoken about before, if you can. Um, try to make sure the language is at a high standard. Um, 
basically this is so that um, the reviewers, we have reviewers from all around the world um, reviewing manuscripts. So um, if the language um, is quite hard to kind of follow or, or make sense of, then that can get lost. Um, and, and you really want to make sure that your message is clear for the reviewers. We do have um, an in-house editorial uh, editing service, um, which you can take advantage of if you want. Um, and then uh, try to make sure that your references are all complete and up to date. Uh, by that I mean try to make sure you're not publishing too much, um, including too much uh, data on file or unpublished data. Um, you want to make sure that um, everything has been published and, and in peer-reviewed journals. Um, some journals may allow a little bit of um, unpublished data if it doesn't form like a major part of the manuscript and some don't allow it at all. Um, and the ones that don't allow it usually would um, sort of unsubmit the paper or reject the paper with a request that either you wait until that data is published or that that, that data be taken out. And then finally, um, just make sure that all funding information is fully disclosed. Um, this is really important, so make sure that you have all of that information before you submit the manuscript. Um, what we don't want, um, basically, it's, it's pretty obvious because it's kind of the opposite of what we do. Um, if, it's a, um, if the organisation um, is quite hard to follow, um, again, um, we might ask for that to be um, changed. Uh, try to make sure that your objects of inclusion match up. Um, try to make sure that it's adding something novel. Um, if it's a confirmatory study or um, reporting ne negative results, um, or if the sample size is too small, um, it might not be appropriate for that journal, um, but we do have um, journals such as the Journal of Drug Assessment, um, which we could refer you to, which um, basically are that, all that publishes really is um, that sort of study. So there are places to publish that sort of research. Salami publication, um, a few people may know about. Um, for those that don't know, um, basically it's where um, a study is uh, conducted and then um, where the results could all be published in one paper. Instead, they're split out into many different papers. Um, and that's, that can be a practice that's done to improve um, someone's publication record, and improve number of citations. Um, so we'd really recommend to avoid that because that's usually quite obvious to the editor. And then any uh, evidence of citation chasing, so if it seems like there's um, too many self-citations within a manuscript, that can raise a bit of a red flag with the editor. Uh, and again, just if, if there's any of this that you're ever unsure about, just do just contact the editorial office. Okay, so on to peer review. Um, these are the top 10 comments that you want to avoid at peer review. Uh, bear in mind that peer reviewers um, for us are uh, experts in the field. Uh, they're very well published and they have a deep breadth of experience. Um, so they will pick up on, on any kind of language um, that's used that doesn't seem um, quite right for the study. Um, which leads me to the kind of the comment at the top of the list, um, which is that it's just a marketing piece or attempting to find a marketing niche. Um, this is a comment that we do quite often receive on industry funded papers. And um, I'd really recommend, as a way around that, just to be very careful of the language you're using. Um, I'd really encourage you to um, just let the data speak for itself. Um, if it's a good product that's being studied, um, then generally the data will shine through and those mirrors will shine through. Um, again, if it seems to be minimizing negative results or overstating efficacy, um, basically the message here is just to be as transparent as possible. Um, reviewers will um, usually pick up on it if there's any gaps or anything that remains unexplained or kind of underemphasized. Uh, as I mentioned before, try to make sure the objective is clear. Um, sometimes we have reviewers um, saying that they don't see what this adds to the literature or they don't sort of understand why there's a reason for that to be published. Um, so just make sure that's really clear. Um, and again, if, they, uh, if there are conflicting studies that have conflicting results to your study, uh, I'd really recommend um, discussing those um, in the manuscript, even if you don't feel that they're directly relevant in that context. Um, usually, if it's not included, if it's a really big key study and it's not included, uh, the reviewers will um, mention that and they will kind of ask for it to be um, spoken about. Uh, so if you don't feel that it's quite re relevant, you can um, mention it, but also explain why it's not quite relevant in this context. You know, it, may, it may only require a sentence or two. Um, try to make sure your conclusions are novel, um, as I said again, um, and also the, uh, pay close attention to the statistical analysis. Um, 
as most people know, the statistical analysis is an important part of any study. Uh, so if it's the wrong analysis um, or it's flawed, um, then reviewers will usually pick up on it and that can be um, a major um, downfall for the paper. Um, so just be really careful about that and consult a statistical expert, expert if you need one. Uh, also try to be very transparent about your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, if it's not clear what patients or papers have been included, um, reviewers will usually ask for that. Um, and make sure that uh, Again, as I mentioned before, um, you're not referencing too much data on file. And also that your references um, are mostly up to date, that you've, you've included any recently published key studies, um, and that um, most of the work that you're referring to has been published ideally within the last five years. Uh, and finally, um, make sure that if you're using the word significant, you include the, a p-value. Um, so often we receive the comment that uh, a significance is used and there's no p-value and sometimes it's, it's just a purely a wording, a wording thing. Um, so just be very careful of the using, using that word. Okay, so you've got through peer review and um, you're revising your manuscript. How can you render a quick decision and avoid rejection at that stage? So the things that really help the editor um, is if you're making sure that you're applying to every single comment. Um, if you have missed the comment, uh, then usually the editor will have to get back to you to ask for clarification on why that's been missed. Um, so just make sure that if you feel like a comment isn't quite relevant or if you, feel, or if you disagree that, that needs to be included in the manuscript, just to use, explain a rationale of why you've not included that. Um, and it's also really important to respond to those on a point-by-point -point level. Um, so not responding at the end in a continuous prose and actually responding to each individual comment with an individual response. Try to make sure that you're using track changes as well. Just that makes things so much easier for the editorial office. It means that they can see very easily what's been done and how it's been done. Um, and it just means that you'll get the, that decision back a lot quicker um, if the editorial office have to spend, spend less time trying to figure that out. Um, and of course, try to make sure that you're submitting it in timely fashion. Um, as most people know, medicine moves pretty quickly. So um, if you're taking more than three or four months to revise, then um, new data may have come out in that time period. So if you're submitting much later than that, we may have to send it back to the reviewers just to check that nothing new has come out in, in that time period. Um, on to other things that can slow, things, slow it down. Um, if uh, you're including new data, that's not always a bad thing. If it's new data that um, reviewers haven't requested, for example, but it's, it's just come out, um, it's not always a bad thing, but um, just be aware that we may need to send it back to the reviewers just to verify that um, the way it's been described is all accurate. Um, and then also try to make sure that all your responses are really clear. Um, if they're too confusing and if they kind of um, go on for like a long, a long sort of number of lines and uh, they kind of don't really explain what's been done or how it's been done, um, then quite often the editor will have to get back to you just to clarify that. Um, so yeah, so hopefully um, that will kind of help you all to just get a bit of a quicker decision on that revised paper. Okay, so you've had your manuscripts accepted. Um, what can you do to measure your impact? Um, and what can the authors do to improve the impact of their paper? Um, I'm not going to talk about the impact factor because I think everyone knows what that is. Um, I would talk a little bit about old metrics though. Um, I know most people know what that is, but um, I just wanted to kind of mention that Basically, it's a score that's produced through um, many sources around the internet. So um, it basically finds references to the paper that are referenced on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, news articles, uh, Wikipedia, policy documents. Um, and the score is weighted by um, what the source is. So if it's a policy document or a news article, say it's BBC News, then that will have a lot more weighting than if it's um, some very niche um, news, art, news site um, or if it's just a Twitter user that has just 200 followers. And also um, bigger Twitter, Twitter users that have say 10,000 followers will have more impact than um, a smaller Twitter user. Um, so what can authors do to basically increase the impact of their paper? Um, we're aware that um, pharma companies can't um, sort of promote their papers, um, or they have restrictions on that at least. Um, so we'd really encourage the authors to be able to just be doing it independently of their own accord. Um, 
One way they can do that is through Kudos, so they can write a layperson summary of their article and they can share that on social media through Kudos, um, which is a really good way of um, getting sort of public in engagement with their paper. Um, and we also really encourage people, if, if any authors are active on social media, we really encourage them to share the article on social media and share it with their colleagues. Um, at Taylor and Francis, we provide 50 free, free pins for the authors to share their article around. Um, so we really do want to encourage them to kind of get their network involved. And usually they're the best place because they have the best networks of the people who are most interested in that work. So um, it's, they are a really good um, sort of driver of impact in their article. Um, finally, I just wanted to talk a little bit about alternate publication options. And by that, I mean video content. Um, the reason I wanted to mention it is that I know that um, they've been gaining a lot of popularity recently. Uh, and there have been a lot of questions about how those are processed and what the impact of them are. So what is a video abstract? It's a short video that engages in engagingly introduces readers to an article. It usually includes relevant materials such as Im images, animations, and simulations to help engage readers and lead to increased usage and citation. Um, it can be um, peer-reviewed in a number of different ways, and I'll cover that on my next slide. Um, but we're also aware that companies, um, it costs a lot of money to produce a video, and we're aware of that. And we're happy for um, the companies to keep the copyright at Taylor & Francis. Um, Sorry, keep, we're happy at Taylor & Francis to keep the for the company to keep the copyright if they desire it. Um, just because we know, we know of the sort of costs associated with it. Okay, so these are the ways that we um, peer review uh, videos. Um, you could either submit your manuscript with the video, you could submit the manuscript with a transcript of the video, or you could submit the manuscript with neither um, and submit the video at a later stage. If you choose to submit the manuscript with a video, that will be peer-reviewed along with um, the... They'll be, both be peer-reviewed together, basically, um, as it would through normal peer review, um, except they'll be asked to look at the video as well. Um, if the reviewers have um, comments that they need to have addressed in the video, um, then the video will need to be uh, modified and then reviewed again. Um, and that, we recognise, can be um, a bit of a cost if they have to go back and address those comments and completely redo the video. Um, which is why we also have the option to submit with a transcript instead. If you submit it with a transcript, the peer reviewers can um, have a look at that, provide any comments on that, and that can be sent back, along with the manuscript, to the authors. Um, then the video can be made based on that transcript and those comments. Um, and then that can be sent back to those same reviewers um, for final approval. If they do still have comments, um, then um, it is likely that the video will still need to be modified. Uh, but um, the benefit of doing it this way is you're reducing your chances of having comments that require modification, and you're reducing the number of comments you're likely to um, need to address in that video. So that can hopefully lead to a lower cost for whoever's producing the video. Um, you can also submit with neither. So um, this is basically where you can just submit the manuscripts and you need to let the editor know that you plan to submit a video. Um, that way they can tell the re peer reviewers and they can expect to, re to review a re video at a later stage. Um, what will happen is the manuscript will go through peer review as usual and then you can choose to submit the video at a later stage. Um, you can either publish the manuscript without the video and then publish the video at a later stage or you can publish, um, wait and publish them both together. Um, but in either case, the same reviewers would be looking at that video. And then finally, I just wanted to talk about um, accompanying video clips. Um, so this is supplementary material, such as videos procedures, um, EEGs, sound clips. Um, you can think of those as like video figures. Um, they must be submitted along with the original submission. Um, and they'll be peer reviewed along with the article, just as a, a figure would be. Um, they can also feature in front of the paywall um, at Taylor & Francis, uh, and that's also the case with video abstracts. Um, and that can aid the readability of articles and make them more useful to readers in real-world world settings. So that's everything from me. Um, thanks very much for listening. Uh, my name is Jonathan Patience, and feel free to contact me. Um, if you ever have any queries about that, I'm always happy to help.